Does everybody have a blue packet? They're at the end of the aisles. There's lots left, so if you need one, grab one. Welcome, thank you for coming today. Um, I'm super excited to be here. All of, yeah. <laughs> um, just hearing all the amazing speakers already this morning, I'm honored to be here, so thank you. My name is Christy Harmon. I currently work at the job service. I'm a supervisor there, and I've been there for 10 years. I normally get to do this class with a gal named Amanda Taylor, and she also works at the job service, and she had a career commitment, so you stuck with me. Um, a little bit of background on the wage negotiation trainings. In 2013, Governor Bullock started an equal pay task force, and he did that out of, um, in Montana, the pay gap is 67 cents to a man's dollar, so uh, we were 40th in the nation. And he said that was un completely unacceptable, and so he started this task force, and one of their recommendations was to start these workshops across the state to try to help with that. So I've been doing them for two years now, and since then, now we're only 39th in the nation, so I'm sure it's because of all of these workshops we're doing. <laughs> I'll take it when I can get it. Um, let's see here. This workshop normally is a three-hour workshop. So I cut it down a ton to try to get it into an hour. Uh, I have my business card in everybody's um, packet. We're more than willing to come to your business, to your class, to your group. Um, if you want us to host one at the job service, we'll do a full workshop for anybody. So um, just let us know. We love to do them and they're always a ton of fun and we learn, we learn a lot from every group that we do. So, um, Speaking of the packets, what's in there is a copy of the slideshow with notes, because a lot of times, especially with this one, I might start talking so fast to try to get through all the information, jot down any questions that you have, and um, we'll leave a few minutes at the end to try to get through some of those questions. And then there's an overview sheet of how a wage negotiation should go. There's some dollar bills in there, and I'll explain those in a little bit, and then obviously my business card. So if after this you have any questions or you want us to do a workshop, just give me a call and we'll make sure it happens. So let's see here. Let's start off with who has negotiated for pay before? Quite a few. That's impressive. Really quickly, how did it go? Just good? Terrible. Terrible? <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's definitely a strategy involved. So um, let's get to some of that strategy. Maybe. Um, this worked just a minute. Oh, there we go. Okay. So there's three aspects to the gender wage gap. Um, essentially what it is, how does it happen, and then why does it happen. So as we go through some of these, uh, we'll go through some of these aspects, and then we'll go into the actual implementation of a wage negotiation and give you some tips to make sure that it's um, successful for you. Sorry. <laughs> so what is the gender wage gap? Uh, the US Department of Labor descri um, describes it as comparing wages of all full-time working men to all full-time working women. So we're talking apples to apples. If you drop out to have a baby, you're not in that, um, no, that statistic. Um, and like I said, in Montana, it's currently 67 cents to the dollar. So that's where the pink money comes in. Nationally, it's 77 cents, and this dollar is 77% of an actual dollar. So in Montana, just picture, it's even smaller. So we have some work to do, um, and for different um, nationalities and things, it changes drastically. So I'll get through some. I must be doing this wrong. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we got this now. So this slide here, this isn't about um, the wage gap. It's actually, this presentation, it's not about the gap itself. It's about how to negotiate. But this just is a quick slide on showing that in ND, every industry across the nation, um, 
men make more than women. Even in traditionally female-oriented jobs, such as teachers, nurses, men are still making more. Um, so it's an issue. It's something that we need to all work on and be aware of. So how it happens, uh, I think Kim mentioned it early in her, earlier in her pre presentation. It's small little increments. So let's just, this is a very basic example. Let's say Jane and Mark just completed their accounting degree at University of Montana. They apply at the same company. They both get, um, they go, both get the positions, same position. Jane starts at 35,000 and Mark starts at 40. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Throughout the years, your salary um, increases if you have, if you get salary increases or bonuses, it's always based on your base salary. So let's say year two, they each get a raise, Jane gets a little bit, Mark gets a little bit more because his base salary is a little bit more. Year three, um, in this example, I always think it's silly that they have us do this, but it's uh, Jane leaves for, to have a baby. And before she leaves, she says, I'm really committed to this, com this company. Um, I really want to come back. And so they say, gosh, we really want you to come back. We'll make sure that you start back at your same, same wage. Um, but in, then in the meantime, they could offer Mark a position raise, a promotion, that sort of thing. So sometimes it's just little things as you go throughout your career. Um, and even if he isn't offered that um, promotion during that time, there's still that chance that um, there's wages and increases throughout those years. So um, the longer you work, the wider the gap grows. And um, just looking at the beginning wages, Jane started at 35 and Mark started at 40. Why do you think that is? Mark asked for it. Simple as that. He negotiated a little bit higher wage at the very beginning. A lot of times women will say, gosh, I'm so excited to have this job that they don't even think about wage negotiation first. When I started this training, um, there was 30 people in the class to learn how to do the wage negotiation. And there was three men and the rest were women. And so when they asked us who had negotiated, guess how many of the women negotiated? Any guesses? One woman, one, one. <laughs> guess how many of the men? Oh. All three of them. And that was an eye opener to me. I had never even considered being able to negotiate for a wage. I just always assumed this is the wage they're offering me. You take it and you say thank you and you walk away. So um, I hope if anything you get out of this that it's, it's a possibility, there's a strategy to it and um, we'll go into that a little bit. But it's definitely um, different between men and women. So. <laughs> All right. So there's some studies that have been done that show that there's an unexplained gap in um, women asking for raises. They show that women traditionally don't ask as much as men. Um, a lot of times they won't be approved as much as men, and sometimes that's the tone that you start your conversation with. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that um, women take credit less for themselves. So if there's a big project that you were successful on, and the boss comes to you and says, wow, that was great, how did that happen? Typically, a man will say, I'm awesome, and I did a great job, and I worked really hard, and that sort of thing. And a woman will attribute the team. We did a great job. We did this together, we did this together. Which is great, but when it comes to salary negotiation, sometimes that gets diluted into what your actual accomplishments are. And then also um, women are sometimes seen as pushy and bossy because it's not the norm for women to ask what they want, where it is for a man. Uh, we're better at negotiating for friends. So one of the studies, uh, Dr. Jessie Smith, I don't know if anybody's heard of her, she's out of MSU, and I um, was able to see a presentation that she did, and she's amazing if you have a chance. Make sure you can see her. Um, she did a study that women for wage negotiation, they did on average negotiated $7,000 more for their friend because they were easier to say, she can do this, she can do this, she's great at this, I recommend her for this. But for yourself, 
we're much more humble and um, we don't want to boast and brag and so we don't um, put ourselves out there as much. And like I mentioned, um, it's more culturally acceptable for women to promote the team instead of ourselves. So it's something that you have to practice to be able to get good at. So why does it happen? Um, I didn't do it today, but when you go home, Google the YouTube um, Pantene commercial. It's like a minute long, and it's labels against women. Some of you have, may have seen it. And it just shows a man and a woman doing the exact same things. But we have these stereotypes where if a man's getting ready, he's, um, he's um, taking charge of himself, whereas if a woman's getting ready, she's being vain. So we use different words for um, men and women based on different activities. Um, when Governor Bullock had started this, he came and spoke with um, all of the trainers, and he said that he realized he has two daughters and a son, and when his son was um, taking charge of an activity, he was like, oh, gosh, good job, you're taking charge. And when, a, when his, one of his daughters was taking charge, he was calling her bossy for the exact same activity. So he vowed to never call his daughters bossy again, that they're being good leaders, because sometimes it's the exact same thing. We just have always said to our girls, don't be so bossy when it's doing the same thing as a boy would be doing. Um, another thing that women usually will just say, gosh, if I just work really hard, I'll get recognized and I'll get that raise. And that's not usually the case. You're the only one that's going to negotiate for yourself and advocate for yourself. Um, my coworker, Amanda, who does this, she always tells a story on what her experience, and I'm going to tell it and she won't mind, I'm sure. So she um, teaches dance classes in Missoula, and when she got hired, they said after six months, if you're still doing well, if your classes are full, you'll get a $5 raise. And um, each of her classes were always full, and everyone loved her as a teacher. So after six months, she was like, sweet, I'll be able to get this raise. She's teaching three to four classes a, a week. And so six months goes by, a year goes by, and she's like, gosh, I'm sure my boss is gonna notice. Like, this is gonna happen. Two years finally goes by and she was talking to with one of her coworkers and the coworker's like, why are you making that low of a mount? Like, what are you, why? And Amanda just said, well, gosh, I, I thought they, were, they would let me know when I was eligible for it. And they said, no, you need to go talk with the boss. So she goes and talks with the boss and is like, well, I know we talked about this, but is it okay? And it was really timid. And um, if it's not in the budget, I understand. And the boss was like, well, yeah, that, that's part of the deal after six months. But she lost out on a year and a half of a $5 increase a few times a week. And she's never going get to get that back. And that's how it just starts. Sometimes it starts at very little increments. But you can't gain that um, and you can't make that up. So the earlier you start, and like I said, you're the only one that can negotiate for yourself. You're the only one that's going to do it. Um, women have said, I'm just grateful to have this job. I don't want to rock the boat. And that can be the case, and there's some tactics that we'll go through. So if you notice um, there's some discontent, you can kind of back down. Maybe he's got something I don't have. So Jane and Mark, Jane thought, well, maybe, maybe he has a higher degree. Maybe he has more experience than me, when that wasn't the case. The only case was that he asked for more. And then this one, I think I can get by on less. So Monica this morning talking about how she was paying her brothers more than her because, oh, she had a husband, she didn't need more. That's a real thing. Like when I th heard this, I thought, gas is the same, food is the same, your rent is the same. So don't just take, well, I have somebody else to help me or, oh, I don't need as much. We all, and we're going to live longer, so you need more. <laughs> so. The thing about this is if you're aware of your own biases, then you can act on it and change it. So um, one more quick little example. Um, when you see in the supermarket, there's the man holding his baby and cuddling, and you look at him and you go, oh my gosh, that's so sweet. And you see the mom and she's cuddling her baby and you don't quite think <laughs> anything of it. 
it's the same thing. It's the dad, he's supposed to be cuddling his baby, but it's our, it's our own biases that we look at things differently when it's the same thing. So just being aware of your bias, then you can look forward and make sure to hopefully change it in the future. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> Do a little jig every time. Okay, so keep in mind what your salary reflects. It's not about you. You don't want to make it personal. It's about what your worth is to the job. And we'll go through and explain how to get that worth. Um, but just remembering it's about your skills and your abilities, not I'm making it personal. It's not because, gosh, I have medical bills and I have student loans I have to pay and I just bought a car and I have this loan. And that doesn't matter. It's what your skills are. Um, So let's personalize the wage gap a little bit. It's said on average, if you have your high school diploma as a woman, you'll make $700,000 less than a man in your lifetime. And that increases with um, your education level. So college, 1.2 million, advanced degrees, 2 million. So on average, they say a woman will make a million dollars less in her lifetime than a man. So I'm gonna have everybody do this because I just, Pull out your million dollars. <laughs> Hold them up and say, I want my million dollars. Hold on, hold on. I think we can do it a little bit better. I want my million dollars. <laughs> yes. So how do we get there? <laughs> Random. So there's three principles to an effective salary negotiation. You need to be objective, you need to be strategic, and you need to be persuasive. And you can't just be really good at one and not the others. You have to be really good at all of them. They're pretty easy concepts, but you need to um, work on them each time you do a ne negotiation. Look at it and say, how can I do this area better? Um, to be objective, that's not personalizing. Gosh, I need this because I have these bills or I have a trip coming up, I need this raise. Being objective about it is um, the fundamental part of being able to do this su successfully. Being strategic about it. If the company just announced massive layoffs, it's probably not the best time to go in and ask for a raise. Um, but maybe it's a good time if you just brought in a huge client that's going to make, um, the company a lot of money or a grant or something that your company has a mission of. And you need to be persuasive. If you just go in there and just kind of him and haw and you're not persuasive, that's not going to um, help you get that raise. So be good at all of them. Each time you do it, go back and decide how you could have done it better because each time you probably can find a few things that you can do better in the future. Okay. Like that one. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep crossing your fingers. <laughs> All right. So um, three steps of being objective. First, you want to choose the right job title, and this is the basis. If you don't have the jo right job title, you won't be able to find the right salary and the right um, benefits. So choosing the title. Um, is the most important, and we'll talk about that to be able to get the right title. Right I'm just going to stand like this. Um, no matter what your position is, there is a job title to it. Sometimes it's really hard to find the right one, so you might need to find um, multiple job titles and pare them down into what works for you. Think of an accountant, let's use that for an example. There's accountant ones, accountant twos, accountant threes, there's all these different levels. 
So you want to um, look at the job description and um, find the one that fits most to what you're actually doing or the position that you're applying for and with this, your skills based on the job titles, um, job descriptions. I thought I had it. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Um, so we're going to go based on the wageproject.org because that's the company that's put this presentation on. But uh, I recommend going to the Montana Career Information System, and that is based on um, research and analysis, uh, actual data that they've got from Montana employers, so it's going to be most accurate. And I have the, that website at the end of this presentation also. Um, but with Wage Project, if you go into calculate what your job is worth, that'll bring you to the next screen. Let's see here. Oh, let's just do it that way. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, the next screen. So you can choose your job category. <laughs> okay, hold on. Oh. Okay, I'll wait when I. So once you go into um, job, job category, and then you can pick your location. This is extremely important also, because if I am looking for a position in New York City, as a retail stores manager in, retail, in New York City, that's gonna look completely different than in Missoula, Montana. So make sure you're picking the right job title based on the location that you are currently working in and you're looking for that raise or the job that you're looking for. <laughs> oh, that may be. So once you start looking through the job descriptions, like I said, you might need to look at a couple of the different job descriptions, and you want to shoot for um, getting to about 75% of your skills to match to that job description to make sure that you have the correct um, job title. Um, you want to look for the highest one that you qualify for. If, if the initial... Um, retail store manager assistant, let's say I'm the assistant and I'm going to be the retail store manager, I'm going to apply for that position. Look at these jobs and make sure that you kind of have the skills, at least 75% of the skills, because if you don't have the skills, you can't um, start negotiating for that salary if you don't e you're not even close. So let's say the accountant position, if there's a one, two, and a three, if the accountant one position requires your AA, I'm just totally making this up, I don't know what accountants need, um, needs your AA and a year of experience, and you have your master's and 10 years experience, look at that second level to make sure that you're getting to the closest um, job description that matches what you're applying for or what you're currently doing to get that next salary increase. So like I said, aim for about a 75% match between um, your job description. You also want to add in the different kinds of accomplishments that you've done, if you've had great performance evaluations, um, any other qualifications that you've gotten in your position, because that is all going to add value to your, um, to your skills and your qualifications to hopefully negotiate for that raise. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So again, when you're um, determining your salary, now that you've gotten your job description, so I'm going to go for the retail store manager posi position, then you can start looking at the salaries that go with that uh, job title. Again, make sure you're looking at the location that you're, you're trying to get that um, raise in. Employers will typically use a salary range of between 25 and 75% of that salary range also. Some employers will look at it and say, we are such a um, awesome company, everybody wants to work for us, we're gonna start at the lower end because we don't have to do a lot of recruiting. 
Other companies will start at the higher end knowing that they want to keep high qualified people. Um, they don't want to have to always go through that recruiting process, so they're going to try to pay a little bit higher. Other ones will just kind of do the middle of the road to start off with. Working in state government, I'm, it's the same way. There's always a range um, that they start off with. So, um, And again, make sure you're listing out your qualifications, your experience, responsibilities. All of that stuff will add value to when you go into that salary negotiation. Thank you. <laughs> so now that you've got your job title, and you can start looking at the range that you can start negotiating with. Um, for the retail store manager, if, I, if that's a position that I'm hopefully going to apply for, uh, in Missoula, Montana, the median um, wage is about 31000 So at 25% of that is the 26, about 27000 And the higher end of 75% is almost 40000 So if I look at that job, description and I have close to 75% of all of those duties that they're asking for and I'm going to go into this position and ask for this wage, what would anybody just think that they'd want to start negotiating on? The lower end, the higher end? Yeah, you want to aim high but still be realistic. If you go in there and say I want $60,000 for this position, you're just not even going to have that negotiation potential because you're going to just price yourself out of the market. But yeah, if you have most of those skills, sometimes in those job descriptions, you're not going to have all of the skills because in each industry, there's going to be things you have to learn, and that's OK. And that's why they say aim for at least the 75% match. If you've got those, you want to start at that higher end. So if I was going into a salary negotiation, I'd start with at least 40 and go from there. Um, to be able to have that negotiation back and forth with the employer. <clears throat> so we just kind of talked about this, what your, should your target be, and that's being, um, aiming high, being realistic about it, uh, to be able to go forward. So after you've gotten your salary that you've looked at, then you can look at benefits. Now with all of the websites that I have listed on that back page, they're all just national averages on benefits. With MCIS, that's the case also. With the salary data, it's very specific to Montana because they do local um, studies, but the benefits aren't um, local yet, and so it's a national average. Um, the chief economist for the state, Barbara Wagoner, she suggested possibly um, bringing that down between 10 and 15 percent to uh, accommodate for Montana's wages and benefits. But you don't want to forget about your benefits because that can add a lot to your package. 20, 50 percent sometimes um, adding to your total compensation. And you want to be as objective about benefits as you are about your salary. So as you go through it, if I'm currently working in a company, let's say this retail store manager assistant, and I want to go for this, the manager position, I'm going to write out all of my benefits that I currently have and put monetary values to them. If you have sick leave, if you have vacation pay, uh, 401 match, all of that has monetary value. So you want to monetize them. And then when you look at the averages of what that, com what that um, industry should be, then you can start comparing, should you ask for more, should you ask for less, um, to be able to be in the market with your benefits also. So if you kind of start looking at it, and I look, and my benefits are more than what the industry average is, you might not want to go too far with those benefits. But if they're a lot less, that's something you really need to negotiate. Just because the employer says, well, we don't offer health insurance, we don't offer this because of budgets, or that's not a concern to you. Um, it's still something that you want to bring to the table to negotiate for you and your family. Um, because a lot of times employers, sometimes it is hard and they might not be able to say, yes, we can give you dental insurance even though we don't have it. But you could maybe say, it's going to cost me $400 a year to get this dental insurance. Can we add that to my salary? Since um, that's part of the benefit package. Um, let's see here. So
So sometimes benefits, you can be a little bit, bit more creative. Um, if they offer one week of vacation, maybe you can negotiate a few more days. Um, can you negotiate the dental or the eye insurance? And if they don't, like I said, if they don't currently offer it, you can do your research and see how much it would cost you and add that to your salary package. Do you have to park downtown? Is that something you can negotiate that they'll pay for your downtown parking? Are you in a professional organization that benefits the company somehow? Those are all things that you can kind of think about that cost you money that will benefit the employer and benefit you at the same time. When I talk with um, high schoolers, we mentioned, well, maybe if you're applying for Burger King, will they let you have your nose ring in? I mean, simple things like that, maybe a flexible schedule. So in the morning, if you're having to take your kids to daycare, you don't have to take leave in the morning or a shortened lunch. Or maybe you can have that flexible um, schedule to make it work for you and the employer and not have to take leave for appointments or that sort of thing. So you can be really creative with your benefits. So I went through that pretty quickly. But now we know how to be objective. So let's get into being persuasive. So this is very important also. Um, you really need to set the right tone to go into the negotiations. Uh, you wanna make it a discussion, not a this is what I need or else. It's a back and forth. You need to listen to the employer, be flexible um, and be careful and be objective. You don't wanna talk about your personal reasons for needing this raise. It's what your, your worth is to that company. So to set that right tone and being objective, um, you wanna use deliberate language and then practice your pitch. When you go in, making sure you're using objective language such as um, according to my research. So they know that you've done your research. You're not just saying, I think, I feel. It's th these are the facts and this is what the industry averages. Um, use language that opens up a discussion. So if they say, gosh, we can't do that, you can help me understand why sometimes you're gonna get some really good information from that employer on the reasons that it's not going to work and that's something that you can negotiate. Uh, if you work for a bank and they have a mission statement, and you just brought in clients to help with that mission statement, bring that up. That's all stuff that helps the employer um, recognize your value and your worth to their company. And um, using language of your boss. Make sure you're getting them on your side. Uh, we share these common goals. I'm committed to this company, that sort of thing. And you also want to practice your ob the objections because not every time will you go in and the employer is going to say, absolutely, we're going to give you anything that you ask for. So if they talk about you're the highest paid sales uh, person in our company, you can come back with, I'm not comparing myself with other people in the company. I am bringing um, you my data of what my worth is, these are my accomplishments, and this is what um, I'm going to be asking for. If they talk about not having the budget for your raise, and that happens a lot, we don't have it in the budget, you can ask them, can we talk about it in three months um, when the budgets come around? Or I know we've had an opening that we haven't filled for the last six months, could we use some of that cost savings? and put it into the raise that I'm asking for. So there's, there's things that you really need to listen to when your employer gives you object, objections to have those responses and continue to make it a discussion. If they say, gosh, I'm never gonna be able to sell this to the boss, say, gosh, if we both agree that I'm worth this, can I go to the boss with you? And you can start this again. So you're showing your value and um, you're willing to work with them. If they talk about things that you haven't done to get the raise, okay, let's make a plan. If I do this X, Y, and Z, can we discuss this again? Um, one thing we also just suggest is to put it in writing. If they say, sure, once you get X, Y, and Z, we can talk about this again. Say, I'd love to put this in an email so we both in a, can agree on it. Because that boss that you've just done all this work with might not be there in six months. And then you're gonna have to start this all over. So if you have some sort of writing, um, it'll help. And that's, How do you deal with that? So the question is if the employer says, no, I'm not gonna put this in writing, that's why we suggest 
would you mind if I wrote up an email? So you're putting it back on you, um, and you might get that, well, it, depending well, on the I, company. I personally, I've had that experience where I had it all written up, and I'm like, I, I refuse to sign that, I refuse to put that in your file, and I refuse to have a record of that. Yeah. So we talk also and I about. Didn't know how to respond, so I was like. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so how would I respond? Appropriately? Yeah. Kind of depends on the employer. I mean, if you know that this is an employer that you may never get anywhere with, you want to know what risks you're willing to take. You might realize at that point, maybe it's time to start looking for a different position or you know that sort of thing. If you know, if the employer is saying, we're not even going to talk, talk about this, know what you're willing to risk before you give the end all be all. So that's, but it's tough. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes just asking that question why, you're gonna start getting information possibly from that employer that you hadn't even considered. So yeah, I always ask why um, in a good tone and <laughs> not accusatory and that sort of thing. So um, talking about the bottom line, if the boss says, yes, we'll give you that raise, what's your response? Thank you so much, and now let's talk about my benefits. Don't forget to talk, to talk about the benefit portion of it. Uh, if they talk about, I can only give you this much, um, that's where you can start having that discussion of, well, maybe next budget year we can put a, this higher raise into it, or if there's other things that you can do, or if you just landed that large client, reminding them of that. Um, they say no. Flat out no. Listen to their reasons. Sometimes that's where the reasons are going to come out that actually it's just not in the budget or that kind of thing that you can talk about. Um, but this is where know your risks and know what you're willing to risk with um, the negotiations when you go into them. So there is, um, there's still fears of retaliation. That's there's been cases where that's happened, so uh, you want to be careful when you go into these. Be strategic. Um, back off if you notice that it's maybe not going the way you were hoping for. And then um, there's also raises are earned. Either when you're applying for that new position, if you have those skills, you have to ask for them, or when you're in the position and you're asking for that promotion, um, so beforehand or after afterwards but you have to ask for it just like Amanda's story that I mentioned earlier she earned it but she didn't ask for it and so she never got it so it's something that you have to do it's only you um, watching out for yourself and making sure that this goes smoothly so so in preparing for the actual negotiation this is where you get to sell yourself know the priorities of your employer so that's stuff that you can talk about when you're bringing this conversation up. Know when the normal cycles of the salaries happen. If they just did a company-wide um, salary increase and you come a week later and say, gosh, I want another one, it might not be very effective. So if they do them on an annual basis or if they do them after um, different accomplishments that people have made. Know when, when they do them, because that'll help. Um, know how they're determined, if they're determined based on um, your production, or clients who bring in, or just a flat level. That always helps to know how far you can go with your negotiations also. And again, don't get personal. It's not about personal reasons that you want to raise. Of course, everyone wants more money but being objective about it so your employer can realize um, that you are being objective and um, factual with your facts. So once you've chosen the best time to ask for your raise, um, you don't ne necessarily have to wait for the normal salary range. If you just brought in a big client or you wrote a huge grant that you can um, talk about your salary at that time, those might be good times to um, talk about your promotion or your salary. Um, different, different triggers, like I said, that if you did something amazing that the employer is going to remember, gosh, yes, we really want to keep this person, that might be a good time to start bringing these um, negotiations up. 
So you want to start your um, discussion professionally. Talk with your employer. Um, say, I'd like to set up a meeting to dis discuss my career development or some something like that. Don't just go in there and say, I want to talk about my raise. So start it as a discussion, friendly tone. And then do your five minute pitch. Have your paperwork with you so they can see you're being objective with your data. Um, so when they come back and say, gosh, you're pricing out of the market, you can say, nope, actually, here's, here's the market data. These are the reasons why I'm asking for this amount, because I've done this and this and this, and this is, um, this is a fair amount for me. And then also listen carefully to what your employer is saying back to you, because there may be reasons that they, it won't work. Um, but sometimes there will be really good reasons that it makes sense that it doesn't happen right then, but it's something you can discuss in the future. So then responding to objections and their bottom line. Remember the language that you practiced earlier, um, being positive, being persuasive, talking about the business and the language of your business and your mission and your goals and how they align, and again, know what you're willing to risk. If you just go in there and say, this is what I want or else, you might be walking out there without a job. <laughs> so know what you're willing to risk, know when to back down, and possibly try it again later. So after you've talked about your salary, then you want to talk about your benefits. Don't forget about those benefits because that can add a lot to your overall compensation. So salary negotiation, it's not hard. It's not complicated. It's just something you need to practice. Practice, practice, practice. The more you practice, the better you're going to get at it. You have to pay attention to the details. You have to prepare for it and be, um, be objective, persuasive strategic and go in with a positive attitude. Um, I talk about practice, practice, practice. So one thing that I have vowed to do and I've started, I have some nieces that are starting to babysit and they're at the age where they're learning. Um, when they go into the, the babysitters and they, I know when I got paid with babysitting, it was usually like $5 for an all night. <laughs> That's something I could have started early to negotiate some of those wages and Talk about, know what your worth is. This is how much I'm going to get paid per hour. So I'm talking with them. They're 12 and 13, because the more they can practice now, the better they're going to be when they get to when they're my age and looking for that promotion. Um, there, I did also want to mention there's an equal pay summit every year. They've done it for the past two years. This year it's in Butte. They're always in April. The agenda's not out yet, but I would highly recommend it. That's where I've seen... Um, Governor Berlick always speaks, but then they always have like Dr. Jesse Smith that I mentioned earlier who talks about all these studies where a lot of this information is coming from. So if you can make it, um, there wasn't any details, otherwise I would have given you all those details also. Any questions? I know I went through that so fast. In my full workshop, we do lots of Lots of practice and roles and that kind of stuff, but yes. So we're in healthcare, and when I'm not a therapist, and oftentimes the um, facilities will always compare your position to other positions in the state of Montana. But if you were to compare us to Washington, Idaho, I don't know, Colorado, it's significantly less. Yet yeah, if they're in a bind and have to hire a traveler, they're going to pay travelers like three times that much. What I learned today is that we should all be talking with each other about our salaries so that we can collaboratively go and try to do a better job at it. But I guess it seems like you're pushed up against the wall and all they're doing is comparing to all these other places in Montana. Um, so I don't know. would be that even in Montana it's going to vary greatly between a little tiny city and a bigger city um, and that that's hard but if you can go in if you can research it may make sense that they're not paying us New York wages because cost of living and that sort of stuff is different but if you're at least going in objectively with these are the wages in our local area and if you're well below that 
being objective about these are the reasons I'm asking for this raise. Um, so it doesn't fully answer your question when they're in a bind and they're needing to pay more. And there was another one, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Do you have any kind of advice on presentation in terms of um, you know, how to dress or how to, like, your body, like, paying attention to your posture or how you're, because you give out certain vibes, you cast a people on them. The other thing is, I know with men, they'll often in negotiation let there be dead silence. Whereas, like, women would want to talk over it. Yeah. And do you have advice that you give people on those two? We don't go in a lot into the, you know, dressing, but having that, um, that friendly demeanor is going to go farther than if you just go in there and this is what I want and this is why. The silence is also imperative when you're getting pushback to just listen to the employer. That's a lot of times where you're going to hear things because if you just stay quiet, sometimes then they're going to keep talking and that's where you might start hearing, well, gosh, we, we don't have it in the budget and you can start doing that negotiations back and forth. Because um, you're right, absolutely right. We, it feels so awkward, right? You feel like, I've mean, heard that now, so I don't know if I've heard that yet. Yeah. And that's where the practice, 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 practice with your friends, practice with your coworkers, um, and get good at the silence, because that could be a prime opportunity for the employer to start talking that they otherwise wouldn't have because you were talking. Do you, don't you guys also offer practice sessions for people in terms of interviewing? Yes. So the job service, I'll promote the job service all day long. We do practice interviews um, and we can bring in some of the wage negotiation also if, if we know that that's what you're looking for. Um, yeah, everything that the job service does is free. So if you have your resume that they were talking about that's 10 pages long and you haven't done it for 20 years, come in and see us. <laughs> we have a nationally re uh, recognized resume writer. She's one in 42 of the whole world in Missoula Job Service. So come in, see us. We're, um, we try to stay up on What's that? I'm actually the one that makes those appointments. So call me. My card's in everybody's. Um, just give me a call. I usually will set you up with some of our employment consultants, and they'll do the um, practice interview and all that with you. I think that employers are very, very good at annually. They do a review and then they present you with this, oh, look, I have given you this raise. And you're, like you say, you feel like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. How can you work into that point negotiating anything? Because I personally have felt like, oh, they know I did a good job. They can see my numbers. This is what they're offering me. You don't want to overstep or you don't want to that whole relationship thing and so you say thank you and walk away knowing full well that oh I should have asked for something. How do you approach that? One thing I would suggest is if you know they're happening happening annually, possibly going in beforehand and saying, I know raises are coming up. Can we discuss my career and my development and the things that I'd like you to take into consideration when you're doing my raise? Um, because if it's negotiable, do it beforehand before it's in that final writing before you had anything to say about it, um, if that's a possibility. Well, and I think so many times we think they're not negotiable, and later on we find out that they were. When you're talking about the um, mark and salary or whatever their names were, you are, are offered this job, and you think, oh my gosh, they, they wanted me, they picked me, they chose me, and you don't realize that you don't have anything to work with. Yeah. And it depends on if it's a new position where you're not in, you don't want to talk about your wage and your negotiation until they've offered you that position. Don't, don't bring up wages until they say, we want you, we want to hire you, then go into that conversation. But yeah, if you're asking for that promotion or that raise in a company you currently work for, um, being as well informed of when they do them, how they do them, that sort of thing, so you can be as informed as, and as objective when you go into it. We try to say if it's possible to not put a number down, that's ideal. Um, because 
a lot of times they're just looking to see what they can get you at. And so if you can bring it into the discussion once they know they want you. So there are applications though where you have to actually fill in a number. Do your research on that company, on that position, and see what that range is. Um, so you're at least putting in a number that's acceptable and not completely out of the market. Um, but yeah, if you can avoid that question, even a lot of times they'll do it in the interview. What would, your, um, what would you be asking for? If you can say, gosh, I'd really love to talk about that once I'm offered the position, or you know, come up with some um, responses that you're not giving them a number in the interview, that's ideal. A lot of time, um, I'm asked in interviews, you know, what would we accept? What are you earning now? And I always respond, um, it's proprietary information. And if you're offering me the job, we can then discuss it. Uh, but that's not my question. <laughs> That's the fine balance of knowing what you're willing to risk. I mean, if you're willing to take that other position, you might want to be able to ask for more, fully knowing that I have this other position. But if you don't have another position, you, you tread a little bit more carefully. So it's completely what you're willing to risk in your position. And are you willing to leave that company and go to that other one? If you are, maybe you can ask for a little bit more because you're willing um, to risk that, essentially. So. I just want to hear the governor's thought at all about looking at this from the other side, like trying to get companies to compete for like a label of being equitable or something. Yes. It does seem a little unfair that all of this, there's a blame for this problem goes on the shoulders of the women who are getting, you know, the lower salaries are getting. Yeah. It, in the training that I did um, to learn how to kind of do this, oh, thank you. Um, it was actually really interesting because Commissioner Pam Busnick, Commissioner of Labor and Industry, she um, asked everybody if they negotiated and that sort of thing. And one of the women in there said, well, I work in a hospital and um, I won't hire anybody that won't give me a wage and that sort of thing. And she was put on the spot. C Commissioner Busey was like, that is wrong <laughs> with Montana today is that employers won't um, won't accept when people won't give them wages. And um, the gal was saying, I wouldn't hire anybody that wouldn't negotiate. And Busey was like, gosh, women don't know how to negotiate. So you're, you're essentially not ever going to hire women um, in those positions. So that is a discussion that employers, and we invite employers to our presentations also. And that's always been a really fun discussion to hear their perspective. And there's always a great conversation piece between the job seekers and the employers in the same room. Um, but yeah, it, it's on the radar. We have five more minutes. Yeah, about five more minutes. Sorry. Go. <laughs> Some companies, it's not, um, you can't talk about your wage, which there's laws and things trying to change that. In state government, all of our wages, you can go and look and see exactly how much I'm making, how much anybody in state government's making. So they're trying to get things where you can see who other people are making to help with those negotiations. But um, that's where that bottom line of, I'm not comparing myself to other people, looking at the, the actual data of what this, um, job and the salary should be and where am I at in that range and should I be negotiating more? I'm just trying to be objective that way versus comparing yourself to others in the company. So the wage gap, that is the point of making others, right? That an employer would hire a man for hard money. Like you couldn't help. What's, I, what was that? Well, it's hard because when I was in the 
when you're looking at those, all those average wages, right? Those are men and women. We'll offer no wage gap. That's the difference between men and women. So if you're trying to notice if there's a difference and if you should be asking for more based on this difference, like the average numbers aren't necessarily going to reflect that. I see what you're saying. Good point. And I'll, I'll ask our um, research and analysis. Good point about that. So you have any advice uh, for, you know, we've, I've, I've been negotiating my salary with my company, and, and I really, I did do a lot of uh, sources that I, that I haven't included in my list. So thank you for that. But but one of the things that they mentioned was, well, you know, we also, we're, we're, we pay a subscription service that, that also um, really understands our mix of uh, back, you know, variables in our uh, market area. And they're a national um, aggregator of this data. And, you know, it may or may not be anywhere in the ballpark of salary.com and, and all these other sources that the job service told you to look and, you know, um, and it's proprietary. And we don't have to share it with you and we're not willing to share it with you. But you you know, so you just never know um, you know where you are, but you know the executives. Uh, we 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 we're, we're kind of you know the, the national mean or median, whichever word they decide to use. Um, it, you know, fifty one percent of such and such. So so without trying with trying to keep it positive and you know keeping things moving forward and not making it as serial, which I don't think it's intended yeah. to be. Do you have any advice for how to work with work with that? I mean, you bring your data. And I'm sure there are other people in the same industry I mean, who probably get that same pushback as my on healthcare. Um, and I don't think it's intended to be adversarial. But how do you what do you do then? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a girl and I'm already like taking all my courage into my hands and said, Can we talk about my salary? And then I just feel really like that's a really that's a, I didn't anticipate that. I had no I don't know what to do. Yeah. That's a tough one. Um, and I don't have a really good answer for that one when they have that not letting it die, you know, at talking about it again in the future, bringing it up, um, letting them know that you're, you're still going to ask just because they said no the first time, um, continue to ask. But that's one more and then we need to do, do Zimba. <laughs> yes. Um, I want to know if you have some local resources for comparing benefits and salary. We hear a lot about the national versus Montana and then Montana as a whole, but I feel like Missoula is different. There's um, a lot of well educated people here. There's a lot of young people. It's really competitive, and yet our wages are still really low. So when you're going in to negotiate, you know, um, can you point to some statistics that maybe you at the Missoula Job Service use to try to <laughs> That's where we would go to the MCIS website and go into Missoula specifically because you'll see in different occupations, um, yeah, each city in Montana are completely different for the same job. Um, and that's just based on they get their research from a research and analysis that they do their yearly um, reviews of those occupations. So that's the most accurate data, except the benefits, those they're currently studying. So the benefit data is just a national average. And that's where they've said adjust that to Montana which might not be completely accurate based on Missoula versus Billings, but. So does the state keep the numbers on how many people leave the state because of salary? They have started keeping those numbers. I know um, when you leave, and they. Where would I bring that to I know our HR department does, but I'm sure each one. I don't know if there's a central location. I can get your information, though, and see if I can find that and give to you. I don't know it offhand. Also, say, you know, 75% of graduates of this program leave the state and take their talent to Utah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Time to go dance.